Hello everyone. I speak to you from the belly of the beast, New York City, where we and the entire eastern seaboard has just endured a date with a ferocious hurricane called Sandy. And I'm sure you're all aware it's disrupted millions and millions of lives. They say over 60 million lives have been affected. Losses. So our heart goes out to those that have lost family, those that have lost property, entire homes that were destroyed. And uh, sadly, we're still in the wake and just discovering how much damage has actually been done. So though my class is usually on location in Manhattan, and that's how we were planning to do it, due to the after effects of uh, the hurricane, the entire transportation system, mass transportation system in New York is closed down. Tunnels are flooded. I hear literally entirely flooded. So there's no subway system, which uh, I believe serves over 8 million people a day. And uh, therefore the traffic is horrendous going over the three bridges from Brooklyn to Manhattan. No tunnels as well. At least not the Battery Tunnel, Midtown Tunnel, and so on. But you can look at these reports. The reason I say all of this is because it's interesting to see in this highly technological world where we seem to have been completely in control, of course, until the Internet bubble bust, burst, and then the economy. But now how nature, Mother Nature, as it's called, or as the insurance companies actually remind us, it's acts of God. Suddenly... The, using the word God is very popular when it comes to saving money because he's a perfect scapegoat where you could just say it's acts of God. Just check your insurance policy. Acts of God are not covered by your policy. So act of God suddenly has humbled a mighty city like New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., all the way along this entire East Coast. And as such, we're directly impacted by it. But again, due to the miracles of technology... Sandy didn't strike everywhere, so I'm able to speak to you live from in the regular time, 8.15. I was very loath not to travel to the city today because I remember after September 11th, which was a Tuesday morning, and everything was stopped as well in New York, but I decided I must go to my class in Manhattan. There were no ways. All the, all the bridges were closed. I had to go through, uh, completely detour through the Midtown Tunnel, which then actually was open. And I came to my class, I remember Wednesday night, and people were shocked, but there were a lot of people, there were a few hundred people. Because what better time to demonstrate our commitment, our devotion to our enduring values than when we're challenged. So I really was loath and was not willing to just easily not go to the city, but to spend three, four hours in traffic or two hours in traffic and then come and see that people can't arrive anyway. So with all that being said, even though you may not be aware of it because you may be sitting in the comfort of wherever you are, Listening to this, I just felt it appropriate to open up with this. As again, my our hearts go out and our prayers go out. And it's interesting to see how, um, as I said, in a highly advanced age, we suddenly are exposed, our vulnerability, our fragility. Um, sorry, it, it, I was sorry that it had to take lives, but it was also a wake-up call and a reminder. And um, though it was not pre-planned, the topic of this evening's discussion was why can't we see God? Which of course is very fitting to this topic because many people that wonder when they see natural disasters. You know, where is God in all of this? It's one thing when human beings um, in horrible ways are inhumane to one another, hurt each other. But there, human beings are doing it. But natural disasters are clearly not of the human making. And yet, it's part of the process and it can wreak havoc and devastation. So it's a good question, a good catalyst to discuss where is God in all of this? And, of course, the same question we ask whenever we see any type of pain and suffering. Where is God when we see newborn, innocent children born, unfortunately handicapped, maimed, hurt in some way? They did nothing. And where is God when we see seemingly senseless pain like someone sharing with me how He's completely lost his faith due to seeing his father deteriorating to all, and uh, to Alzheimer's. You know, why? 
Well, I'm not here to answer all these questions, and I don't believe I can answer, and should anyone be able to answer the unfathomable mystery of pain and suffering. But I do want to address this topic of God and God's presence in our lives. And, of course, the question, why can't we see God? Which, of course, leads to the next question. You know, science is based on empirical proofs, different types of proofs. And one of them is, since we can't see God, since we can't experience God, at least not with our tangible senses, so many conclude you can't say it's a scientific fact that God exists. It's a matter of faith. And the reason I chose to discuss this topic this week is because this week's chapter in the Torah actually begins exactly with that. The Yera, a love Hashem. We're talking about Abraham, who right after he circumcised himself in the last week's chapter, in this week's chapter we're told that God appeared to Abraham. A love, Vayere a love. And he, and Vayere a love, God appeared to Abraham by learning Mamre, in the plains of Mamre, where he was resting and recuperating from his circumcision. And then the Torah continues and tells the story, how he raises his eyes and he sees the nomads, and so on. But let's stop upon, let's stop on this verse, Vayere a love Hashem. It's an, it's, it's an episode. It's an event. A major event. It doesn't happen every day. What did Abraham actually see? And what is it that we can't see? And there's also a classic story. I think I've shared this story before with one of the Hasidic Rebbes. The fifth Chabad Rebbe. Rabbi Shalom Dov Ber. Who, you may be familiar with him in my teachings recently of Ayin Beis. Hemshech Ayin Beis, which was delivered by him 100 years ago. So he's born... Exactly 152 years ago this week, the 20th of Cheshvan. This period of time. So the story goes that when he was around four or five years old, he went into his grandfather, who was done the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Chabad Rebbe, for a blessing for his birthday. It was this week's chapter. When he went in, as soon as he entered the door, he began to cry, began to weep. His grandfather said to him, why are you crying? He says, I'm crying because I I read that God appeared, Hashem appeared to Abraham. And why doesn't he appear to me? Why can I not see him? And the Tzemach Tzedek responded to him and said, that when a Jew, a Tzedek, in some versions we add that, a Tzedek, a Jew Tzedek, at 99 years old, decides, determines to circumcise himself, He's worthy of God appearing and revealing himself to him. But there's two aspects to this story which need clarification, and of course in the context of our discussion. First of all, before the answer, it's unbelievable. How many people do you know cry because God doesn't appear to them? He didn't cry because he was in pain, lonely, loss, a hurricane, he cried simply because he read that God appeared to someone. Why doesn't he not appear to me? And of course the answer requires as well explanation. Well, on a basic level, when a man does such a thing at 99 years old, when you can imagine the pain and has such commitment to circumcise himself, he's worthy of God appearing. But if he's worthy and it's possible for God to appear to someone, the question still remains. Yes, maybe this child is not yet worthy. But what will it take to be worthy? And is it really possible to see God? Because we also have the statement, which seemingly contradicts this whole episode in a way, when Moses asks God later in the book of Exodus, and he's on the mountain and he says, Show me your glory. And God says to him, No man can see me. No person can see me and live. And then he continues, God, and says, For he says, I will show you my back, which is, of course, a metaphor. I will show you a reflection of myself, a, an expression, an outer dimension. Upon I love you all, but my face you shall not see. And here we have a Yero of Hashem, simply stated, God appears. Yes, it's clearly a big event, an eventful uh, day, but he appears. And this child is crying, Why doesn't he appear to me? Clearly, God does appear. So what did God tell Moses that no man can see me and live? What about Abraham? Abraham saw you and lived.
So on a basic level, you can say maybe what appeared here is that it didn't appear his face, he appeared his back. Just like he told oh, Moses, you can see my back, that perhaps Abraham was only saw a dimension of God. Well, if that's the case, if it's already dimension and not the actual thing, so that means someone can be worthy of seeing it. And even if, you, even if you're not on the highest level of Abraham, so maybe you won't see as well as he sees, but at least something. So what is this whole thing about seeing God, not seeing God? What it challenges us and provokes us is to, to ask a very important question. You know, there's expressions, cliche, seeing is believing. Is that true? You know, we have optical illusions. We have marketing gimmicks. We have sleight of hand, magicians. We have all kinds of methods that are used today to make you think that something is real because you seem to see it. Is seeing actually believing? And what do we actually see? How much do we really see? Today we know, and we don't need a faith any longer, that the invisible forces are what shape life. If someone says to a child, asks you, daddy or mommy, you know, tell me, what gives us life? Is it your arms? Is it your legs? Is it even your heart and your brain? The answer is, all those are correct, they're part of life, but what is the root of life force? Is something very minuscule, invisible to the eye. A life force. <clears throat> The forces that shape our being, our fiber, that shape our existence, our being, are cells. Cells are very tiny. No one has seen a cell. Perhaps under a microscope you can see. DNA, chromosomes. When there's a small mutation in 75 trillion cells that a human body has, what kind of havoc it wreaks? We have our own internal Hurricane Sandys as well. So today we realize that forces that shape life are actually not seeable. That's on a microcosm in the human being. We're told the human being is a small universe. The universe is a large organism. So what about the existence around us? You look around the room, you see tables and chairs and books and, and so on and people. And Is this what you see is what you get? The answer is no. Within each, with each item, each entity in existence is made up of Elements, we know. Elements in turn are made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles. And they're sub-subatomic particles. And who knows how deep down the rabbit hole we can go. And there is where existence comes into being. In the minuscule levels. You look at a computer today. Just to give an example. What The power that's necessary to compute that we have today, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, would require an entire city block. The ability to concentrate so much energy, so much power in microchips, and again, the word micro is one of the miracles of science. Yet again, we see that size does not matter, and what we see is not what we get. You see a small little object today, it can be carrying the power of the largest weapons that to the face of the Goli would seem far stronger and far larger. So clearly when we ask ourselves the question, you know, why we don't see God, we have to ask ourselves the question, what do we see? What defines reality? Now, we're not going to dismiss and take away the power of sight. It clearly is a very powerful force. You know, you'd like to see the person you love. You can stare at someone you love. You stare at the face of a child. We stare at a, 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 the beauty and awe of nature. Our eyes are a great gift. They're a blessing. But as we say in the Eshet Chayel, that we say Friday evening from the book of Proverbs, Sheker hachein vehevel hayefi. False is, is, that is grace or and hevel ayefi, and empty is beauty. Ki'im, what is powerful? What should we worship? A woman that fears God. That's who we should value, we should love, tisalu, we should praise. What is the meaning of the verse? Why does the verse have to negate chen and yefi? A second question. We sound chen and yefi 
are two virtues we find in the Torah. Noach's name is the Noach's name is the referred Nun Ches, Ches Nun, that he found grace in the eyes of God. Charm. It's considered a quality. Yaifi, beauty. This is how Sarah is described, Rivka is described, Rachel is described, Yifas Toyar, Yifas Mara. Beautiful. Beauty is a creation of God that is considered a virtue. Why suddenly are we saying false is chain, grace, or charm, and empty, hevel, empty, or vain is beauty. And what we should focus on, Isha Yiras Hashem, a woman that has the fear, has the respect, has awe of God. There's a similar expression in another verse that says, Al Yisal Chachm A wise person should not praise himself with his wisdom. He should praise the God that gave him this wisdom. And the explanation there is the same thing. The verse is not saying, do not praise wisdom, do not praise beauty, do not praise um, charm and grace. It's saying, if you only praise that, and you don't realize the soul of beauty, and the soul of, of charm and grace, then it's considered empty. So when we see external beauty, the way the Kabbalists would put it, that's a reflection of inner beauty. Where does it become a distortion when you start worshipping the outer and forget that there's an inner? So once you have the Yirat Hashem, you have someone who realizes that beauty is really a, a divine expression. That love is divine manifesting. To kiss a human being is to kiss the face of God. Then you realize that the kiss itself, the beauty itself, is also permeated and saturated with something deeper. So that's what the verse is saying. That alone, standing on its own, it's sheker, it's false. Standing on its own, beauty is hollow. But when you understand the inner forces that make something beautiful, then, which is the divine force behind it, then these beautiful things are a great virtue. And, and even on a practical level, think about it this way. You love someone. They're very beautiful in your eyes. Then the day comes after 120 years, and everyone should live long and be healthy. A person passes away. And you see their, their body in front of you. They may still retain the beauty. But will you hold on to that body and say, listen, let me beautify it, let me hang it up? Yeah, you may have pictures. But no, you won't do that. Why? Because the beauty is not the corpse. It's not the physical container. It's the person inside this container. So when you package something, the way in a healthy context, the package reflects what's inside the package. So the packaging is also beautiful and it's symbolic to you. And you recognize within it lies the inner beauty of this human being. And you love the entirety of them. The inner and the outer. Upon death, and I'm using a a strong example just to make the point, these two are separated. So the inner beauty remains with you in your memory. Sadly, you can no longer see it in the outer because no longer the outer is now inanimate. It doesn't have the soul, the spirit within it. Where do we see this distortion? We see it in the world in which we live. In which we live, we have become seduced and hypnotized and programmed that seeing is believing. So we can be given a package. The package could look beautiful and what's inside is worthless. I'm not suggesting every marketing every marketing effort and every advertisement is false. But many of them are. They sell you an image. And you buy into the image and as a result you think this is what I want. Because we're superficial people living in a superficial world. And the way the Hasidic masters and the Kabbalists put it we live on the surface level. On the surface level, what, what you see is what you get. When you think about it, you realize there's a package. There's a package and layers and there's something within. But it's very easy to, create, to have a dichotomy and separate and a schism between the inner and the outer. And that's when it's shekhar. That's when we have to know what is false and what is real. The entire book of Kehelet that King Solomon wrote in the later years of his life Apparent is, 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 initially it appears to be a very negative and resigned book. Hevel Havalim uses the same word. Hevel Hayefi. 
Beauty is empty. Hevel, vanity, emptiness. Hevel means many of those words, like just air, luft, empty. So his whole book begins, Hevel Aval, and the whole world is Hevel Aval. To the point that the sages were considering to conceal and to not, and to put into, um, to archive the book of Kehelet and that we should never use it. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be public because of the, some of the negativity, some of the contradictions, because it seemed also like heretical. But because of the last verse, the Talmud tells us, the last verse says that all is heaven, all is vain. Except the connection to God, the fear of God. Exactly the same st- statement. Isha Yiris Hashem Yitisalo. Or Al Tisal Chachem Bechachmase. Except in the appraising the God within it. Once that last verse was in there, the whole book was redeemed. You could say, one second, maybe they should have concealed the rest of the book and just give us the last verse. No. Because the last verse tells you. That the Hevel Havalim, the vanity of the world, is vain as long as you're not recognizing a soul within it. When you recognize a soul, it elevates the world. It's not like we dismiss it. Once you understand the purpose, then you realize in this empty, superficial world, where we, bre- we celebrate quantity over quanti- quantity over quality, we, come to, we need to come to appreciate the, the, the power of spirit over matter instead of matter, matter over spirit. This is what the whole Kehelet is about. How does this bring us back now to the issue of God and sight and so on? Pretty clear, if you think about it. What, what do we, we speak? We see something. Why don't we see God? Maybe the question is the other way around. Maybe anything real is not seeable. Eyes are limited tools. They see certain things. How far can you see? Even the best vision, 20-20 vision. How far? There's a certain limit. You come to a certain point, you can't see further. You can't see behind the wall. If your eyes are weaker, you definitely makes it harder to see. So what is sight anyway? So I'm no doubt, as I said, sight is a gift. But it's a gift when you realize that what you're seeing is is a type tip of the iceberg of what is lies within. So the question, why can't we see God? One could wonder the other way around. How could God be seeable? If God could be seen... Maybe it's not real. Real things are beyond the scope of seeing. Now I'll give an example, an example that I often share. And that is the example of communication. Why is it that when it comes to talking about who you really are, someone says, tell me what's going on inside of you. We find very few words. When it comes to talking about superficial things, the weather... Well, the weather became less than super, not so superficial this week. But often, the weather, sports, sports out of season, can talk and talk and talk and talk. It's even called talk radio. When it comes to talk about yourself, say something intimate, say personal, very few words. So initially we can say, the reason for that is, because we're, superficial things we have no problem talking about. Internal things, we are ashamed. We keep it, we protect it. It's precious. But it's deeper than that, because even with someone you trust, you'll find it difficult to express. So that's the question. If it's so close to you, you should be easier for you to express it. We see when a teacher conveys an idea to a student, he has to manifest it in examples, in proper words, and bring the idea down in a container that the student can receive it. If he would just let his ideas flow as they are, the student would be confused and, would, and disturbed by the whole thing. So what is revealed is only a small dimension of what really is inside. The question is why? The answer is very obvious. Think about it. The answer is because words are containers. And as containers, containers are limited. How much can you pour into a quart, a container that's a quart? A quart of liquid, a gallon, five gallons, ten gallons, every container has its limits. Words are also containers. Letters are containers. Expression. These containers are too small to be able to express the intensity of an intimate feeling. 
So when it talks about when you talk about superficial things, there isn't that much energy. I'm actually using a metaphor used in Hasidic thought from the Kabbalistic teachings of Oyer and Keli. It also happens to be the theme of this of these discussions in this in these weeks of Ayin Bays, which I'm in the middle of teaching right now. You go to ayinbays.com, you can find links to these classes that I give every morning. So talking about energies, energies and containers. Containers reflect the expression of something. What contains it? The letters on the page are containers. The ideas they convey is the energy, the oil. So when it comes to very intense things, the energy is just too much for these containers. So words are not adequate. So we create the language called metaphor. What is metaphor? Metaphor are examples, poetry, riddles, words that are not written in the regular conventional way, and they in a sense expand the container because they allow your imagination to take over. So now we found a language that can contain more intensity. But when you go even deeper, even metaphor is not sufficient. Sometimes simply a cry, an oy vey, a laugh, a guttural sound, a raw guttural sound can convey volumes more than an entire essay. Entire litany of words. Because the intensity cannot be contained by containers. And then there's a sound that has no sound. God forbid when a person suffers a great trauma, you see they can't even cry. It's a moment of shock. It's so intense, you can't, even the expression of a cry is too much of a container. So what do we find? An interesting paradox. The more real something is, the less visible it is. The less distinguishable it is. The less tangible it is. The less real something is, or better put, the more superficial, the more surface level, the tip of the iceberg, the more revealed, the more we can express, the more words there are. So if you think about it that way, let's talk about God. If God is the essence of all reality, what is this formula? What does this formula tell you? That the more real something is, the less tangible, concrete, the less uh, visible, the less we can experience it with our senses. So God, if being God is the essence of reality, would be the thing that is least visible and least tangible. So when we say, why can't we see God? What we're really saying, let me re- rephrase it. Why can't I, a small mortal with my limited vision that sees only the tip of the iceberg, See this deepest reality. In other words, you want God to come on your terms. Which of course is a statement out of arrogance. What kind of right have you to say that? I always give the example with the refrigerator and the electricity. Where does a soul go to upon death? The question itself, that the question that so many of us ask, the question is based on an arrogant assumption. You're where it's at, and you wonder where does the soul go to? Who says you were where it's at? Where did you get that conclusion from? What is the assumption based on? So imagine a refrigerator asking electricity, where do you go to when they, when they pull the plug? And the electricity says to the refrigerator, and he's incred- incredulously, what kind of chutzpah is that? What nerve is that? You're a little box they just invented 100, 200 years ago. They figured out how to create coils and electrical current that you contain me for a little while. And you know how to refrigerate, and you can refrigerate food. And then when they shut you down, you think, now I'm the center of the world. You're not the center of the world, you're just 100, 200 years old. I go, where's electricity? I go where I always was. I go back to my natural habitat. My natural habitat is not confined in time and space as you know it. So the, narrow, the, 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 the arrogance, so to speak, or you could say the narrow-mindedness of the box, is it only sees it from the perspective of the box. So the box asks, where are you? I don't see you. But if you think about it for a moment, are we going to determine reality based on the perspective of a, of, a, of a measly, mundane refrigerator? Or a light bulb? What we conclude from this is that what we see, we worship. And we think our sight is the arbiter and the determiner of what is reality. And that's what the Eshet Chayel is coming to negate. Sheker, it's false what you see. The beauty you see, the charm, the grace you see. What's real? The soul within it which you don't see. And when you embrace that, this is the second half of what I'm going to discuss, then the outer also becomes real. Because one can conclude everything I just said, okay, very nice. 
Fine. All things that are real are not visible. I mentioned God. Let's mention a few more. Love. Is love visible? Love may be one of the most driving, strongest forces that drive existence for good or for bad. Is it visible? Can you see love? Yeah, you can see someone in the throes of passion. You can see the effects of love. You have expressions of love. A kiss, a hug, an embrace. But love itself, the feeling of love, that which we all know what love feels like when you have it. And, you've, and what we know what it is when we don't have it. We feel the lack of it. Invisible. Ideas. In the brain. We know we have ideas. Call it whatever name. Is it visible? No. You cut open a brain, you're not going to find ideas pouring out. Just like if you cut open a hard drive, you're not going to find data. But we know it's bits in there. They're in there. But they're not visible. Definitely not to the naked eye. Truth. Is truth visible? Well, look. If truth was visible, we wouldn't need courts. We wouldn't need juries. We wouldn't need arguments back and forth. You just look and you see the truth. How much money is spent on looking for the truth? Trying to piece together evidence, witnesses, to find out what happened at that particular moment. Because people's memories are very selective and people are subjective and they lie. Lies dominate in this world. You want to know what you see? You can see a lie. If it's masqueraded well, it can look like the truth. So there you go, truth again. Invisible. And you go down the list, or up the list, of everything that is real, the more real, the more invisible it is. Because you see, eyes are just one limited tool that just give us a small picture of some reality. Not the whole picture. Talk about beauty. Even what we do see with beauty, as I said earlier, is it the beauty of what we see our eyes? Or is it the beauty of a confluence, a convergence of many factors? Coordination, the personality of a person, their spirit, their verb, their vivacity. And of course God. If God is the innermost entity, reality of it all, He would be the most invisible. I shouldn't even say He. That too is a human definition. And as Abraham came to discover, that the part of the whole, meaning each of us cannot dictate what the whole is like. A piece of a big picture does not dictate the big picture. It's the big picture that dictates the small picture. That's how it should work. But we become very narrow-minded. We become parochial, myopic vision, and we think our perspective, that's it. So I want to see something, I want to see it now on my terms. That's how we function. And therefore when we say, why can't I see God? We're really saying, is I decide what is real by my sight. Why well, I want to see God? But if God is like truth and love and so on, maybe you can't see it. Maybe you can't own it. Maybe you can't control it. It's something that is there, and you experience it in deeper ways, not through limited vision or limited sound. Take sound, for example. We hear certain sounds, but how many sounds are going on right now that you don't hear? Animals hear sounds, they hear lower frequencies than we do. How many frequencies are out there? Right now there are people speaking on cell phones, and all kinds of using this television and radio and all kinds of waves, and you don't hear any of them, because it's a different frequency. So you're going to say, because I don't hear, it's out of earshot. I don't hear what you're saying. That doesn't mean that you're saying, you're that means you're not saying it? No. Go into a different frequency and you'll hear it. And the same thing is with every one of our tools. Limited tools. The classic example I've often brought is from when the, one of the physicists was asked, how do you come to these, these bizarre conclusions in quantum mechanics? We've never even seen atoms, let alone subatomic particles. Bizarre Rule, bizarre, bizarre laws that were discovered. Uncertainty, improbability, light can be wave and particle. States that we never could even imagine. And his classic example was of a fisherman who spread his net over the seas and gathered together fish of all sizes and shapes and species and so on, and colors. Documented it all. And at the end he came to a great conclusion. What's his conclusion? There are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. No, argue with him. He, all the fish he's documented, they're all more than a half inch. Not one fish out of the millions of fish that he, that he caught are shorter than a half inch. 
empirical evidence, absolute. He's about to make his great statement, great revelation to the wizards of the world. When his little child, you know, like children, the emperor with no clothes, says to him, but daddy, I, I've seen fish that are shorter half inch long. No, I just documented them all. But daddy, I've seen them. My own eyes. You don't know what you saw. That's what he's telling him. Until the child points out to his great grandfather, his great wise father, a simple reality. What tools did you use? That you forgot to look at. And they looked at the net. The net had half inch spaces between the ropes. Now what happens when the net has half inch spaces? Anything that's smaller than a half inch is not going to be caught. It's going to fall back into the water. So the, they were both right. The scientist just forgot to qualify what he said. He said there's no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. He should just add one sentence. When you use a net with half inch spaces, there are no fish that will be caught that are shorter than half inch long. But then again, do we need a scientist for that? So it's all about tools. You could say the tool, the net doesn't see such fish. But the net has half inch spaces. It only has half inch. You want to see such fish, you need shorter, you need clo- smaller smaller um, spaces. You need cl- cl- smaller gaps between the different, the net and the net, and the fish net. You want to see truth and love? You can see it, but not with your eyes. Your eyes are limited. You, some things you need a microscope. Some things a microscope won't work. Like I said with the words. Conventional words, a metaphor, a cry, a laugh, a song, and silence. Sound of silence can be deeper and more powerful than the sound of sound. So we see from this that when we ask questions of what we see, what we don't see, we're basically saying it's easy. I'd like to live a life that's easy. What's easy to me is what I see, what I hear, what I touch, and so on. But you come to realize that if you want to appreciate truth and love and so on, you have to start learning. It's not about you and your refrigerator and your little box. It's about a bigger picture. I can't resist telling the Chelem story I often tell in this context. The Chelem story goes that the Chelem farmer, Chelem of course is a small little town, um, which they say was in Poland, they say wise people live there, but the neighbors... Resentful created this folklore and all these fables about the fools of Chelem. So Chelem, there was a farmer in Chelem. Chelem was a small town, as I said. No technology, no buildings, no subway systems. Hurricane um, Sandy would not have done much damage there because there was nothing to damage. So this, but this farmer in Chelem, his farm was tiny, but it was his farm. It was his baby. He inherited from his parents, who inherited from their parents. So he knew every grain of soil. It was his child. One day he gets a letter from his cousin in the, in the States. From a big town far, farmer, big city farmer. He comes and visits. And he gives him the royal tour of his Chelem farm. And then they sit down to dinner. You know, this little farmer in Chelem couldn't even imagine what the United States looks like, let alone a big farm like that. And they sit down and the Chelem farmer says, so what do you think about my farm here? Isn't it a nice, beautiful farm? He says, yes, it's nice and cute. But it's so tiny. Helen Farmer is taken aback. What do you mean it's so tiny? He's insulted. And how big is your farm back in wherever that big state? Kansas, Texas. So the American farmer is thinking, how is he going to explain to his um, provincial cousin what the farm, the size of the farm? So he's thinking of a metaphor. He says, ah, it takes me all day to travel from one end of, with my tractor from one end of the farm to the next. Suddenly the Chelem farmer looks at him with compassion, empathy, and says, don't feel bad, cousin. I once had a tractor like that myself. Now, <laughs> the farmer was not being malicious. He was speaking from his perspective, his refrigerator. His narrow farm, his limited farm. He never saw something else. If I was to pass around and ask everybody, are you objective or subjective? Are you narrow-minded, open-minded, or closed-minded? Most people would not write that they're closed-minded or narrow-minded. Because part of subjectivity is it makes you think you're objective. But the true answer is you have to say, I'm as objective as my perspective allows me. 
I'm as objective as the context that I have. There are things I may not know. So I'm not objective completely. No one of us is objective. That's the qualification. Based on my observations, based on my limited observations, based on my limited experience and perspective, here is what I've concluded. You state, you state your perspective. Based on a, a net with half-inch spaces, I only catch fish with half inch that are half-inch long or more. So for the farmer, when he heard that it takes all day to travel from with a tractor from one end of the, to the other, he was convinced it can't be the farm. He didn't even think, he can't even fathom such a size. So he was sure it must be the old shmata jalopy that his cousin has, which reminded him of his own, that it took all day to crank up to get from here to there. Instead of understanding that they're talking about bigger horizons. When you stand on the ground, you only see a small horizon. You climb in the mountain a little more. You climb higher, higher, higher. So it's all about perspective. So with that in mind, we all have our farms. And it's actually a blessing that God cannot be seen. We'll soon get into, of course, the times God makes appearance. Because truth, love, reality should not be contained in our limited containers and our limited perspective. It would undo and would compromise the integrity of what we want to have in God, which is, we want broader perspectives. Imagine you had a great teacher who understood things far greater than you are, than you understand them. You're the small farmer, and the teacher who loves you so much, you know what he says, okay, we're going to look at it from your perspective. And he never keeps anything mysterious. He completely compromises his wisdom in order to make you feel good, that you should feel like you understand something. That would be a disservice. Because he's taken all that power that he can teach you and help you expand your containers to understand it and it's come down to your level. If we were able to see God like we see um, um, superficial things, packages, like we see external things, then we lose the power of God which is the beyond us. The reason we don't like that is because it's elusive and we like control. Especially insecure people like control. Secure people don't need the control. They understand. They want to climb the horizon. So what would you prefer? To delude yourself into thinking that you have the picture? Or would you prefer to climb the mountain and realize, hey, there's a much bigger horizon than I have? If you ask your comfort zone, your comfort zone, I want to be comfortable. If you ask your truth, the truth inside of you, that says, I want to see the truth, even if I'm not so comfortable with it. And this, my friends, is the secret of all truth of love. When you're ready to let go of your perspective, that greater perspective begins to speak to you. You're not ready? You're not going to let him in? The Kotzka Rebbe said, when they asked him as a child, where is God? Wherever you let him in. I'll give you a penny to tell me where God is. He said, I'll give you two pennies if you tell me where he's not. It's all perspective. Where is your soul? You won't be able to see it in the mirror you can see your body in a mirror. So if you focus and worship the body itself and forget the soul, sheker. It's false and empty. If you realize there's a soul, then it puts a whole new perspective. And now we go to the second half of the discussion. Because based on everything I've just said, one could argue, okay, that means we have to suspend and give up our superficiality. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we experience with, experience with our tangible ter, uh, tools, on our small farm, in our refrigerator, with a net of half-inch spaces, and all the other metaphors I used, is null and void, should be annihilated, should be disappeared, because it's all superficial, it's limited. And we should be focusing on reaching the light, on climbing the mountain. Now there are philosophies that argue that especially certain Far Eastern philosophies, that what we see is all illusion. What does Judaism have to say? Clearly not that the case, because we see a virtue that God appears. We see Moses wants to see God. So clearly there's something to be said about that. So here's the second half of the story, which is even more fascinating than the first half. The first half challenges your question. Why can't we see God? We can't see anything that's real. Because you and I are limited people, and we only see very superficial things. But it doesn't end there. The end, if that would conclude there, then basically it's about 
recognizing how inferior we are, how limited we are, and that's that. And if you want to discover reality, climb the mountain, search for God, search for the invisible. But there's a deeper element to it. That same God that's invisible and beyond it all created and put into place this reality and this farm and this my, this um, tip of the iceberg. And he created us in a way that we appreciate outer beauty. He's not asking us to destroy our outer expression of things and our limited view. He's asking us to suspend it, realize there's something deeper. But when you realize there's something deeper, that deeper perspective can now be expressed outwardly that the outer beauty should reflect the inner beauty. That's the ultimate goal. And that's why it's a big thing that God appears to Abraham. That even on the perspective of a farmer, you know, I'm not going to compare Abraham to a farmer. He was a farmer, he was a shepherd, but his perspective was large. But even on his, on his perspective, what he could see with his eyes, God appears even there. That means that an outer expression of the outer reality that we experience can express the inner reality of the divine. And this is actually the theme of this week's this discourse in Hemshech Hayim Beis, where he talks about that we should be able to reveal in quantity, quality. Which means, yes, by all means, package something nicely. Let the package be nicely, but let also it reflect the inside. An interesting thing, in Hebrew, the word for a face, you know the word for face, the Hebrew word for face is a face, is a panim. A panim is a face. But panim also has another meaning. It means inner. Pnim. Pnimiyut. Within. Now when we say the face of something, the surface of something, we're not talking about the inner, it's exactly the opposite of the inner. We say the face, the surface of the ocean, the face of the object, the face at the face of it. We're talking about ostensibly it seems that way. What's underneath can be completely different. In Hebrew, the outer and the inner are the same word. Why? Because that's the way it's supposed to be. Your face shouldn't just be a false expression of who you are, it should reflect who you are. Your inner self comes through the windows of the soul, are your eyes. But we see we live in a world where we have echad bepeh, echad belev. You could say one thing and your heart feels something else. You can smile to someone and stab them in the back. That's the dichotomy of a material world that conceals its insides. Our, the purpose of existence is not to travel inner and just realize that, that we can't see God because on our terms, our limited terms, we can't see the divine, the invisible but to bring the invisible and it should become visible. So the objective is, is to learn to express the inexpressible. To see the unseeable. To hear the unhearable. The inaudible. Because that is the ultimate goal. This is what in Judaism we call, when God says, I created heaven and earth. In order for you to transform it, not to destroy it. Not to escape from it. Not to realize it's just an inferior entity. No, I want you there in that universe, in that existence, which conceals the inner soul. I want you to discover the inner dimension. In quantity, I want you to discover quality. In matter, I want you to discover spirit. And then the Sheker HaChen Hevel HaYefi, when you discover that it's really the divine force that gives it life and spirit, then the outer beauty becomes saturated and permeated with inner beauty. And Panim, the outer and the inner become one. And that's why this was such an achievement. Abraham, because he circumcised himself, because he paid heavy price, God appeared to him and said, even on your terms, I will let you see me. And that's why the Rebbe Rashab as a child began to cry. He began to cry because he realized that why don't I have it on my terms? Why the Tzemach Tzedek could have answered him, your little child, we can't see God. It's invisible. But he couldn't answer that because the child was citing a story in the Torah that he appeared to Abraham. That means he could appear to human terms. So why doesn't he appear to me on my terms? And that's where the Tzemach Tzedek said, no, he could appear on your terms, but you have to pay a price. You have to, because if you're just on your terms for your satisfaction, no, that doesn't work that way. You're a refrigerator. You're a little small, narrow place. You have to first be aware that you're narrow. 
You have to be aware that there's a bigger perspective. You have to be ready to climb the mountain. And when you climb, then that emergence of the divine will emerge even on your reality. But it doesn't just work one way street. Abraham paid a price. And that's why he was worthy. Now let's go to, to Moses. Moses says, Let's put it in context. This is Moses on the mountain after the Jewish people had sinned the great transgression, transgression of building the golden calf. Total betrayal of God. And Moses goes up on the mountain, as I've discussed many times, to beg for forgiveness, for hope. And when God reveals to him his 13 attributes of mercy, this is the story of the month of Elul, the month of reaching all the way from the month of Elul, the month of compassion that prepares us for the new year and leads us into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So in this process, when Moses is begging God and trying to dig deeper and find God's inner primius, inner essence, he says, show me your glory. Which means he wants to see something that has not been seen till now. Because why is Moses asking for that? He's not asking for that because he suddenly has a, he suddenly a, uh, some desire to see God. It was because he knew he had to go deeper to, 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 to invoke and to be able to dig deeper. Like when someone doesn't want to forgive, you have to go deeper and awaken in them a deeper element. So he says, I want to see what you really like. Because I know when I really see what you really like, I will see love. I will see deeper love. I will see forgiveness even for a people who sinned. And God's answer is, no man can see me and live. No person can see me and live. He's God is saying the obvious, but also not so obvious. Because also Moses also knew that God appeared to Abraham. So there's no question that Moses' request was deeper than the revelation to Abraham. Because the revelation to Abraham came as a result of Abraham's great mitzvah, commitment and dedication. Here Moses was looking for the seeing God's face that brings tshuva, repairing a broken thing, which requires even a deeper revelation. So Moses knew that revelation is possible, just like he saw that God can come on our terms. And that's what he wanted. Show me. That God has that dimension with him, in, obviously. But I want to see it even on our terms. Because I need to be able to come back to the people and say we have hope. And God says, no person can see me and live. What he's saying is, the secret of it all. You, you cannot see me and live. You, on your terms cannot relate to the essence of who I am. And yet, he continues and says, but I will show you something. Which means in some way he was addressing and pacifying Moses. Because the question of course is, Moses also understood you can't see the essence. So when, after Moses said that, and God said, you know, no one can see me and live, he was basically saying the secret that everything we're discussing here, and that is that the essence of God, reality, cannot be seen on your terms. Which answers another question. Earlier on, the Medrash says, the Talmud says, that when Moses first meets God, and that's in the burning bush, it says he covers his face. doesn't want to see, because for this reason, he doesn't want his eyes his limited eyes. He wanted to appreciate the reality of it. So he stood in awe. We cover our eyes when we say Shema. For the same reason. We don't want our eyesight, our farm, to block the vision of seeing what's really true. When you hug somebody, you really love somebody, often you close your eyes. Because eyes are not, are not, are not uh, uh, don't do justice. And not, cannot contain the intensity of it all. And God says to him, look at me, back then in the burning bush. And Moses refuses to look. So it says in the Talmud, that now when he came to here and God said, and Moses says to God, show me your face, God says, when I wanted to show you, you didn't want to look. Now you want to see? No. So the obvious question, what is this, tit for tat, God is getting even? No. That's the story. You can't see it on your terms. Now you want? 
You as your your farm, with your refrigerator, with your narrow, relative to Moses, of course. Moses saw much. He reached 49 gates of understanding. But he didn't reach the 50th. Now you on your terms, no. When I wanted to show you meant on my terms, then yes, then you didn't look. I was going to reveal that essence to you. So to go back now, but what happens here at the end? It doesn't end here. They just says to him, no one can see me and live. God continues and says, but I will show you my, fa- my back. And then he says, but my face I won't show you. Why does he repeat again, my face I won't show you? Which of course brings us to the question, did Moses not understand and had to ask this? And, how, and ask to see when he knows that you cannot see the divine because it's beyond us? So what was he asking for? And also, why is the Torah documented? If, if it is no significance, if Moses was wrong and he shouldn't have asked. Clearly he should have asked and we want to know the answer and we want to know the whole process. And why was his request denied? A tzaddik asks for something. It says a tzaddik decrees, God fulfills. God decrees that tzaddik can breach, can transcend. Tzaddik gezer, kosh baruch hu mekayim. I'm sorry, uh, that that uh, that the God that, that God decrees at Kaj Baruch and he and a tzaddik can overrule that, and the opposite as well. The answer is, as the Panim Yafis explains, that the way we read it is God says, "I will show." And why rub it in? You can't see my face. God is saying, "I'll show you my back, Upanai, and also my face." And then comes the comma, lo yiro. But my face you'll see by not looking. So God did respond. He said, I will show you something on your terms, my back. But if you want to see my face, you could see it, but you have to not look. You have to not try so hard. You cannot use your terms. So Abraham, because of his mitzvah, he got a, a, a vision of able to see something divine on his terms. Moses also got something on his terms, the back. But the essence, the ultimate essence remains beyond. So it's a constant dance of relating to something beyond us and at the same time having some revelation within us. Because it's a relationship. It's not just, oh, I'll forget about all my interests. Everything I look at is superficial. I just want to have the reality. No. Even on the superficial level, you get some revelation if you have the bitl and the humility to not look with your own eyes. So the first step is to realize that the question why I don't see God is an arrogant question. It's a narrow-minded question. It's basically saying that my sight is what matters. No. Recognize that your vision is a small vision, a myopic vision, doesn't see most of the picture. Very little of it. Once you realize that, then what comes back to you is that even in your life, even in your world, and in your reality, on your simple level, even in your farm, you'll also see something. Going back to that story in the chapter Shmois with the burning bush, so you could ask the question, so why did, if God said to him, I want to show you, and Moses said, Moses covered his face, and God said, I want, yeah, you should have seen, you should have, when I said I want to show it to you, that's when you should have looked. Why can't you say, for example, that Moses covered his eyes, and through that he would see something deeper? Because God wanted to show him not just with his eyes closed. He wanted to show it to him with his eyes open. But it can only come when God wants it, on God's terms. When you want it, your, me wanting is already the farmer speaking. That's already your refrigerator speaking. And there's a limitation there. So there's a constant process where you need to suspend yourself in order to enrich yourself. That's the key. To become a greater person, you have to be ready to go outside of yourself. If you want it all on your terms, you will not have reality. You want reality? You have to be ready to suspend, and then it comes back to you. Without your effort, it comes back to you. It just emerges within you, because you're now able to contain something that's beyond yourself. So is it beyond or is it within? answer is both. And that's the secret to the whole story. That's the secret to the whole story. So now, we look around the world. We just saw Hurricane Sandy. Are these, are these acts of God? We absolutely believe everything is divine providence. I'm not getting into now why would God hurt innocent people, the issue of good and evil and pain. I am addressing, however, 
that there's God's hand in everything in our lives. But we have a choice. If we look through our eyes of the refrigerator, of our farm, of our net, our little farm, then you see your life, you see what you need, your needs. When you look deeper, you see a divine choreography. Every aspect of your life, of my life, every step of the way, this is your footsteps are led by God. And there's a choreography, an inner choreography. So what you see is only the outer element, the outer extremity. So when you end up somewhere, you think, I went there maybe for a business trip, for vacation, for some other ostensible reason. That's the outer reason. If you think only that, that's Shekhar and Hevel, that's empty. However, there's a deeper reason that you were led there in order to enrich your soul, in order for you to say something kind to another person, in order to fulfill a deeper choreography. It was all pre-planned that you should be here at this time, but now you have the choice. And when you recognize that it's not your plans that brought you here, there's some higher plan, then even your plan gets also permeated with that, high, with that higher state of consciousness. So it's not just ignoring your interests, it's realizing that your interests just see it from the tip of the iceberg perspective. There's a deeper story going on. And when you look around, there is the hand of God everywhere. So can you see God or can't you see God? It's up to you. To see God, as I said, is like seeing love, seeing the essence of reality. Our sight is too limited to be able to see that. But we could see flowers blooming. We could see a sunset. We could see the face of a person we love. We could see the beauty of a child. We see so much in this world that is beautiful. And instead of just looking at extremely, oh, that's a beautiful sight and I like it and I, and I uh, will smell the flowers. Think about it. This is God's presence in your life. And you're seeing it on your terms, but you need to determine and realize that it's not about your terms. It's not because I see it that makes it beautiful. It's because it's beautiful from within. And that within manifested in, outer, in an outer expression of a beautiful flower, a beautiful song, a beautiful human being. That's what that spirit makes it beautiful. When you recognize that, then you can begin to see God in your life. Now if you want God in your terms, I want it when I want it. Because I'm needy now or whatever it may be. No, you're not going to get it. You're going to get your farm. You'll get what you, uh, what, you, what you bring with. You come with your basket, you'll get what, what fits in this basket. What fits in the basket of a narrow human being in this world? Things that are tangible. Things that are superficial. You want the depth? Words alone are not enough. You want something that's beyond natural expression? You need to do something to get there. You can't come with a limited basket and containers and say, I want to have energies that are beyond these containers. But when you do sublimate yourself and say, I'm ready to understand there's something beyond me, then in your containers you receive energy and you receive even energy that's beyond your container. And you see this even with a teacher, we see the example with a teacher and a student. If a student is not receptive, a teacher cannot teach. So the student needs, if the, if, the, if, the, if the student thinks he's as smart as the teacher and knows it all, what is he going to get? He's going to get, you know, many of us, when we speak to somebody, we just want to hear validation that you agree with what I said. Very often we ask people advice, we don't want their advice. We want to feel good about ourselves that they agree with us. And if they don't, we either, either dismiss them, or we say we, they didn't really mean that, or, they, or, or we didn't hear right, and really they meant what I meant. Which is of course childish, but that's what we are, insecure. So a student with that attitude is not getting anything. And if the teacher indulges and patronizes the student and says, yeah, okay, you know what? It's the way you understand it. And, and I'll agree with you. So what? Basically, it's like the, 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 the great farmer is saying, okay, he wants to think it's a jalopy. Let him think it's a jalopy. Instead of understanding these big wide horizons and big broad new horizons, you say, okay, you know what? The way you see it is right. That doesn't uh, motivate growth. A good teacher and a good student require that the student be receptive to something beyond and I see all of us have to be that way. We always have to be a Talmud Chacham. That's the quality, that's the, quality, that's the praise and compliment you give a real scholar in Judaism. You don't say a Chacham. When you say a Chacham, it almost means a wise, a, wise, a wise guy. A Talmud Chacham, you're always a student of wisdom. 
Because Reish is Chachma, Yiras Hashem, the same thing. Reish is Chachma, the beginning of wisdom is Yiras Hashem, realizing that there's a divine force behind it. Like I said before, with Isha Yiras Hashem, Hitis Halel. It's the, the fear, the awe of God is what she be, she be praised by. And then the wisdom, and then the chain, the, the grace, and the beauty becomes permeated and lifted to that inner dimension. So a student has to be receptive. Once you're receptive, then you're ready to grow. Now we climb. We start climbing, we start expanding our containers, we start developing new ways of thinking. And the, and the student grows to the point he can begin to get, he or she can begin to get what the teacher, the depth of the teacher's understanding to the point he can become like the teacher, he or she. But it was only because he was receptive and realized I, my box is not what defines reality. And then when you accept that, then you're able to relate to that reality because you've given up. And that reality then can come back to you on your terms. But obviously this isn't a game. Like they say, the one who uh, runs away from honor, the honor runs after you. The one who runs away from respect and honor, the honor uh, runs after you. Anyone who pursues honor, the honor eludes you. So you'll say, you know what? Okay, if I want honor, I can't run afterwards. You know what I'll do? I'll run away, but I'll look over my back to make sure it's running behind me, like a dog does with its master. No, that's not the, the, the game. That's not, this is not a game. When you truly are ready and receptive to a bigger picture, the bigger picture will come to you on your terms. That's the story. So we can see God only when we don't want to see Him. Or more importantly, when we, we can see Him only when we do everything possible to appreciate that we can't see Him. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but all truth and love work the same way. It emerges when you don't try to hold on to it and own it. So, there is God in our lives. And as I always say, God itself is a stereotypical word. What does God mean? We're not talking about the guy with a white long beard in heaven striking us with lightning when we, we misbehave. We're talking about a choreographer. We're talking about an artist. We're talking about something that's beyond artist and beyond choreography. A reality that we will never fathom. And that's perfectly fine. And we will never see. But that reality, put this reality in place. So this reality has within it that higher reality that we cannot see. So our, our sight can actually access that which is beyond sight. Our number can reach a place that's beyond number. Our containers can reach a place that's beyond container, beyond energy, all the way to the essence. Quantity can package and contain quality. But only when the quantity is subjugates itself and allows the quality to shine through it. So in practical terms, obviously going back to a disaster like Hurricane Sandy with this loss of life and property and pain and all the other things we're going through. We're not talking about that part. Obviously our hearts go out. Compassion is necessary. But we're talking about finding God. You can find God everywhere. You know, um, one of the things, the powerful things, I was giving, uh, uh, we're learning a class on Monday evening. That was the night of the hurricane. The rage, the full ferocity of the hurricane struck land um, at uh, around 8, 9 o'clock Monday evening. Um, and we were, I, that night I had a class, a, a class in this community here. So one of the people in the class wrote to me, texted me and said, are we going to do the class? And I wrote back, Stalin, the, the wicked Stalin didn't stop us. Hurricane Sandy will surely not stop us. And we had the class. I mean, it was, not, it was all within the community. It wasn't, didn't require travel and putting great risks. But it was very windy. But we never studied the way we studied that Monday evening. Because in a way, the challenge and recognizing that there are enduring value, values that withstand even a Hurricane Sandy and have withstood worse than Sandy... As I said, Stalin, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, got, got, may his name be a race, gives you a certain strength to realize that we can endure it all. So it's true that there's losses and we should not know of anything like this, but there's strengths that we can learn from any of your experience. The strengths that come out of, uh, sometimes out of tragedies. The unity, the recognition that we're vulnerable, the wake-up call to realize that our farm with all its technology and its iPhones and its, all that, 
is very dependent. We're very dependent. And when the power goes out, the power goes out. And it was not by man-made, it was a wind. Wind and water. The basic elements. With all our technologies, we cannot control. So who's in charge? It's a lesson to teach us what is the soul and what is the body. Now we should only have lessons that are positive. We should never have to deal with anything that's negative. But things happen. We live in a world that's out of, out of, out of sync. I've written, when we call Hurricane Francis and Hurricane Katrina and the tsunami several years ago. I wrote articles about it describing different lessons we can learn from it. Not justifying, but learning lessons because these forces, these natural forces or acts of God as the insurance companies tell us have many lessons for us in our lives. But above all, it's about not taking and seeing and real, it's coming to realize that it's not our perspective that defines reality. There's a bigger picture going on. There's a bigger picture that is something that is beautiful and awesome when we acknowledge it. So why can't we see God? We can't see God because we come with narrow tools. We could see Him as soon as we give up those tools. And then you discover a reality that is the true reality called the invisible power of yourself. The visible You know, someone asks you, how strong are you? Can you overcome these challenges? So, you know, newborn children have all the excitement, and we'll explain that in a moment. But many of us get resigned. Ah, I really can't. I once thought I could. Now I feel I'm too weak. I'm too old. I'm too resigned. I'm too jaded. Too many disappointments. What are you saying? You're saying your perspective is all that matters. And if someone says to you, but that's not true, I know you. I personally know you have more power than that. You say, I don't see it. You don't see it. Why don't you qualify? Because you come with a little net with half-inch spaces. You come with a small farm. You're a refrigerator. Using the analogies I gave earlier. Say that. Maybe your perspective, don't worship your perspective. And as soon as you stop worshiping it, you'll be able to experience something deeper. So we we become our own worst enemies. That's the lesson in all of this. You can't see God. That's good that you can't see God. That will make you realize that you can't see other things as well. There are a lot of things, real things you don't see. You don't see your potential. How much potential do you have? What you see is just a fraction, just a limit, the tip of the iceberg. You look in the mirror, is that what you see? Is that who you are? You're in a bad mood, is that who you are? You're hurt and you feel like a victim, is that who you are? No. What you see is limited. Come and recognize that there's something deeper to see. And that deeper is not visible initially to the naked eye. And when you acknowledge that, you suddenly open up yourself to new potentials. And then that God, the godly energy within us, that invisible, starts emerging. And you realize, one second, what's more powerful, what I think I am, or what I really am that I don't know about? What's more powerful, the visible me or the invisible me? There's no question the invisible you is far more powerful. And sometimes it takes a challenge, a hurricane. Like it says, a, a olive does not produce oil until you press it. We don't know how strong, like a tea bag. We're like tea bags. You don't know how strong we are until you put yourself in hot water. So the challenge suddenly teaches you there's invisible forces that you would never have seen had you not been challenged, had you not been pushed. And suddenly, so with an olive, when you look at an olive, do we realize the power of an olive? No, when you press it, suddenly it produces olive oil. Same thing with human beings. Put pressure. And suddenly strengths, invisible strengths emerge. The invisible is what shapes you. The DNA, the cellular structure, the subatomic particles. How do we access those enormous forces? By recognizing that the force that you see is very superficial. And then those outer, that inner energy informs the outer you. So the outer beauty becomes an expression of the inner beauty. So this is the story, my friends. We have a God in our lives. It's been stereotyped. God has been rendered into a fairy tale, nursery school myth that's very simplistic, childish. But if you think of God as the ultimate invisible force, the essence of everything within, and we can access it, but you can only access it when you're ready to suspend your narrow perspective, your egocentric perspective, and realize there's a bigger picture. That bigger picture then embraces you And your small little piece of the puzzle becomes part of the bigger puzzle. Imagine we're all little musical notes. 
But we lost our way. We're no longer part of a composition. Everyone's playing their little music or not playing it. And you think you're it. You're the center of the universe. My little box, my farm. Where are you going to go? You'll go as far as you can go in survival and taking care of your needs. Then one day, you're aware. You become aware. You have an epiphany. You read something. You just sense. One second, there's a bigger reality. And you realize, you know what? My little piece of music, my little, my little song is a piece of a, a puzzle of a, a, a piece of a puzzle of a far larger mosaic. And I'm ignoring it. As soon as you recognize that, that you're part of a bigger picture, then your small picture is no longer just survival, it becomes part of a whole story. You become a chapter of a long narrative. That's our challenge, and that's our gift. You and I, everyone on this earth, is an indispensable musical note, an indispensable verse or chapter in a most glorious story. On our own, with our narrow, myopic vision, we think our little chapter is not even a chapter. We think we're self-contained, and that's that. We may not even know our little story. And then what behooves us is to realize there's a bigger picture. Maybe a hurricane reminds us. reminds us that technology doesn't conquer the world. reminds us that we're human beings at the end of the day. We're, we're, we are fragile. We're vulnerable. reminds us that love is more important than gadgets. So we realize there's a bigger picture. As Leonard Cohen sings, there are cracks in everything. Forget your perfect offering. There are cracks in everything. That's how the light gets in. Cracks. Or else we think we're self-contained. Everything is great. And then we realize we're part of a bigger picture. And the beauty of it, that that informs your small picture. So you go back to work, but now it's no longer just isolated. Your story, your life story, becomes part of a bigger story, which informs your life story with something that is invisible. So there's an invisible and visible component. The invisible, obviously, is the force behind it all. The visible is what you see. But then once you acknowledge and you accept the invisible forces and that inner choreography, then the invisible informs your visible life. So God should bless us all. First of all, we should know of no destruction or devastation or pain. And we should be able to rebuild those that have lost. And all of us should learn the proper lessons. As Maimonides says, when the calamity strikes, we must learn lessons in our lives. All the lessons that we learn about what is important in life. And above all, the lesson of God's hand in our lives. To discover the choreographer that has written the script. And we have the free will to choose to be part of the big picture. Or God forbid, to remain in our little farm and thinking this is reality. This is our challenge. And I hope that all of us are able to implement it. And we get the power of Abraham, Hashem, where God reveals to Abraham and the Abraham within each of us that we're able to create this type of relationship and connection and are able to connect in ways that allow us to, to ultimately create fusion of our outer and our inner selves. So until next week, I wish everybody a very meaningful week a week of uh, love, a week of vision, a week of the visible informed by the invisible. And always remember how powerful your invisible forces are. That which you don't see is far more powerful than that which, we, which you see. And you want to access that through your humility, your modesty, and bitl that allows us to reach that place. I want to conclude by saying this class is dedicated to the art site of our dear friend Philip, his mother, Yutes Cheshvan, the 19th of Cheshvan, which is this coming Sunday. It's one day before the 20th of Cheshvan, which is the birthday, the 152nd birthday of the Rebbe Rashab, as I mentioned. And um, so dedicated. Philip will not be giving his class tomorrow. He's smacked there, right there, downtown Manhattan, which needs uh, its own uh, Yeshua, its own uh, salvation. And we will be back next uh, Wednesday. Please God. And uh, with that, I bid everyone a very good week. And please stay in touch. Please send us your email addresses to be able to keep in touch. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to our weekly updates about the classes, as well as the weekly emails that I send out, you can feel free to do so at MeaningfulLife.com. And as always, it's a great honor and pleasure to spend some time with you.
to, uh, to that you've given me some of your time and I give you some of my time and together maybe together each put together our piece of puzzle and create this larger mosaic and finally bring the ultimate reality with this total fusion between the inner and the outer thank you very much and everyone have a very pleasant week <laughs>